Good morning. Welcome. Please stand and let's sing praises to the king. seated. Good morning. Just two quick announcements. Um, the baptism has been moved from a next Sunday to July 28th at China Lake. So if you haven't been baptized yet, please talk to Wayne. Uh, the second announcement is that obviously we're not having our outdoor service today. That has been moved to next Sunday. But our call to worship this morning is from Psalm Chapter 145, hear the word of the Lord. I will praise you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, 
and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, you are worthy to be praised. And so this morning as we have gathered here as your people, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us, that you would incline our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Draw us near to yourself corporately as the body of Christ, but also as people, as individuals, uh, that we would be near to you, that we would abide in Christ. Pray that we would be meditating upon your glory and that we would praise you for the wonderful things you have done, O oh Lord. And as we look out into our world, Lord, we see much evil, much wickedness, much ungodliness. And we pray to you, O oh Lord, who sits on the throne, and we ask that your righteousness and your justice would fill not only this land, but this community and our homes, Lord. This morning, may we set our hearts upon you, and may you be glorified this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we read the Apostles' Creed together? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of There he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. A few weeks ago, Wayne introduced that we are going to be going through a catechism together as a church over the next year. And so if you've had a chance to purchase the New City Catechism, this is one version of it. This is a basic version available on Amazon. It's fairly cheap, and it contains the questions and answers. I also wanted to point out that there is a devotional version of it that includes commentary from different theologians throughout the ages, as well as modern pastors. And if you prefer, there's also an app that you can download. It's completely free, and it has all of those resources as well. And just to give a little plug as to why we're doing this, this is a, this is a tool that we would hope to use that would enrich your life and give you the, the answers some, to some of the hard questions as you encounter the world and people who might ask you about your faith and as I use this with my children in our, our family worship I, I usually take the New City Catechism and I, I bring it down to their level um, but again the, the idea is that if somebody asks you why you have why you have hope in, the, in this life you would have an answer for them and with that said that's the first question What is our only hope in life and death? And the answer is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the scripture to go along with that is Romans 14, 7 and 8. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Just as a, a, a quick encouragement as well, that 
fathers and, and leaders of the home would, would take this opportunity and take these questions and meditate on them throughout the week with your, with your family. Use this in times of family worship. And if you're a little bit concerned of how to bring this down, I, I have younger children, and this is probably a, a, a tween middle school kind of level catechism. But to take the second question and answer, that God is the creator and sustainer of all things, it would sound something like, God made everything and keeps everything going. He has no beginning or end, and he's bigger than you can ever imagine. And he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We'll go over that next week, but you can see how if you were to take the time to take this language down, it not only will help your children to understand it, it'll give you something to talk about throughout the week and, and obviously help you understand the content of, of this catechism as well. So let's stand and worship. Created. 
seated. Good morning. <clears throat> Pastor Wayne asked if I would come this morning and read from the scriptures, and he asked if I would give a brief introduction of who I am. I've had the pleasure of meeting a couple of you folks. Some of you know me from a ways back, uh, my connections to Temple Academy. And uh, my name is Glenn Smith. I live in Albion, and I have pastored two different churches for 12 of the last 14 years. I am currently on an indefinite medical sabbatical, have some issues I'm working through. Uh, but I am hoping that uh, the Lord has led me and my wife, Melissa, our grandson and son here to be a part of this church family and to help wherever we can. Uh, he asked that it be brief. Uh, again, I've been preaching for a number of years. I'm not sure what brief means, but there you go. Hope it was. I'll call your attention, please, this morning to the book of 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 18. 
And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be still. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance. While the two of them stood by the Jordan, Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They said to him, Behold, now there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on the mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and they searched three days and did not find him. They returned to him while he was staying at Jericho and he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Let us bow and approach the Lord this morning in prayer. Father, we do come before you and ask that as we hear your word this morning, that you would, again, as Ethan asked, that you would prepare our hearts to receive it. That whatever anxious thoughts we may have of the things that are going on in the world, that we would cast them upon you and that we, through your spirit, would hear your word and be prepared to act upon it. We pray for Pastor Wayne as he comes, so that you would work through him, that your spirit would use him as a tool to teach us to be able to be the ambassadors for Christ that you ask us to be in a world that so desperately needs him. And so we offer this up, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus. May your spirit work here this morning. Amen. Thank you, Glenn. It's good to have you and Melissa and and uh, Dustin Garrett with us, and uh, look forward to fellowshipping and ministering together in the Lord. I heard a new definition of preaching this week that I think is very uh, right to the point. 
You take the word and you put in the middle of the word a hyphen between the E and the A. And what do you get? Pre-aching. Anybody that's gotten up to preach knows exactly uh, that's the experience that you have before you preach. All week long, there's a lot of pre-aching that goes on as you study the word and meditate and pray and you're trying to get the burden of the Lord for his people and how can I explain this? How can I, what are the applications? How do I apply it? Uh, how do I illustrate it? So a lot of blood, sweat, and tears go into every sermon, believe me, if you've never preached. And uh, this sermon is no, no different than that. There's been a lot of pre-aching this week. Do you ever wish for more of the Holy Spirit's power in your life so that you can live a, a victorious life overcoming sin, or power to, to grow in Christ-likeness, or power to thrive and flourish in ministry, power maybe to cross over some rushing Jordan River that's in your way, power to overcome some obstacle uh, up to greater fruitfulness in your life. I know I do every day, sometimes every hour, and I trust that many of you do as well. Here uh, this morning, I want to glean three lessons from the life of Elijah that will help us, hopefully, to experience more of God's power in our lives, working in us and through us. And the goal this morning that I have is that we would, we would learn from Elijah what he learned from his mentor, Elijah. Elijah is being groomed to fill the shoes of this great man of God, this leading prophet of Israel. And the time is near when, when that's going to happen and Elijah will be taken away from him. And Elisha is thinking, I am not ready. I, I'm too weak. I'm incompetent. I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm just a farm boy from Abel Mahola. How can I ever replace Elijah? God help me. The main teaching from this passage that was read this morning that I want to share with you is this, that the God of Elijah gives his power to us in proportion to our yieldedness to him. The God of Elijah gives his power to us in proportion to our yieldedness to him. By yieldedness, I mean our dying to ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. I mean circumcision of the heart where we're cutting off fleshly desires and passions in order to do God's will and, and to, to rely upon God's strength. So how can you and I experience God's power in our lives daily? That's a great question. Here's the first lesson from Elijah. Walk with the godly and do not get separated. Elijah was, was attached to Elijah like a metal washer to a magnet. He would not let Elijah out of his sight. Elijah's ministry is ending on this day. And Elijah is just so nervous and fearful, and rightly so. He's feeling like Joshua when Moses was going to pass on the baton of leadership to him. He would become the next leader over Israel and take them into the promised land. And it was just overwhelming. It was too daunting. And Elijah, like Joshua, needs confidence. He needs encouragement. He needs confirmation that, yes, indeed, God is calling me to do this, and God will strengthen me to do this. He's been the servant of Elijah now for seven or eight years. More than that, he's been a student of Elijah. He's studied the man because he wants to learn everything he can from, from him in order to step into his shoes one day. More than that, he was a son to Elijah, a spiritual son like Timothy was to Paul. They were very close. Elijah is his hero. Elijah is his father. Elijah is his mentor. Elijah is his leader. And there, these, these sandals of Elijah, they're like size 18, and Elijah's feet are only size 8 in his mind. He's been 
close to him these years. And Elijah is the spiritual leader of Israel. He's the pillar. He's the prophet. He's the chariot of Israel to this apostate northern kingdom of Israel. He's the miracle worker. He's the mouthpiece of God. He's everything to Elijah. And the Holy Spirit has revealed to him that today the Lord is taking Elijah away from you. And the dreaded hour is near. Just imagine this morning if, if today the, the Lord revealed to you that sometime in this day he's going to take away the dearest person on earth to you. You would not let that person out of your sight. You would not leave their side. You would spend every precious moment that you could with them. And that is the case here with Elijah. So the first spiritual lesson here of how to, how to glean the power of God in your life is to walk with the godly and do not get separated. Three times Elijah says to Elijah, look, God is telling me to go here. Why don't you stay behind? And Elijah is adamant about, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. He's defiant. He's always been obedient to Elijah, but today he is not going to obey that. You're not going anywhere without me today, Elijah. He's like Naomi, glued to Ruth. When Naomi said, Ruth, don't follow me. Don't, don't come back to the land of Israel with me. Go back to your own people. Go back to your own family. And Ruth said, no, I will not. Wherever you go, I will go, Naomi. Your, your God is my God. Your family is my family. And so the same here with Elisha and Elijah. I think one of the biggest mistakes that Christians make today is that sometimes we think we can do this Christian thing on our own steam. That we can just, we can do it. We don't really need the church. We don't need other Christians. I'm strong enough that I can do this on my own. And so the, the result is there's some isolation that goes on to some degree or, or cutting off yourself from other godly people, from godly company. It begins with, with first of all, kind of pulling back from the corporate worship service. I, I know I have lived long enough to see this happen at least a hundred times, where people who begin to, to get a little bit arrogant spiritually and begin to drift, one of the first things they do is draw back from the corporate worship time, as if it is optional, as if it's not really all that necessary. I can go out on my own into the woods and pray and worship, or I can meet somebody at Starbucks and have a spiritual conversation, and that is my church. Hebrews 10.25 is emphatic that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Do you know that when we gather together like this on Sunday to worship the Lord corporately, that God is pouring grace into your life? Whether you realize it or not, that, that you are growing spiritually if your heart is right before the Lord, there are good things that are happening here on a Sunday morning. God is, God is speaking to you through His Word. He has something to say to each one of us this morning. And we have something to give to God. That is our worship, and joining together to worship and lift up praise is a good thing. The book of Psalms is full of corporate worship and praising the Lord. So this is the first thing. The corporate worship time becomes less of a priority, not just an optional thing. And then people begin after that to neglect uh, opportunities to walk together with other godly Christians, like I don't really need to be part of a Bible study or I don't really need to make time in my life to get together with, with other believers. I can do it on my own. And so you're not with people who challenge you, who encourage you, people who would instruct you, people who would motivate you spiritually, people who would correct you. Do you have people like that in your life? Do you rub shoulders with people like that? If you don't, seek it. Make it a priority. Pray for it. Find other godly believers that you can have fellowship together with. 
just yesterday we got a parcel in the mail and uh, it was uh, it came all the way from Scotland and Linda opened it up before she realized it wasn't for her it was Christmas in July for me but a, a, a good friend in Scotland a missionary there had sent over I don't know why but he had sent over some books to me and a, a nice athletic shirt of the football team of Scotland and um, one of the books that he sent was The Life of Martin Lloyd-Jones. This is, uh, I have this in two volumes at home, but this is the two volumes condensed into one, and I cannot wait to dig into this because this is my greatest mentor from the last century. Martin Lloyd-Jones died in 1981, but you can still get his sermons online, and the power of, of God that works, you can just sense it as you listen to him preaching. And so, thank you, Brian Lowry, if you're listening this morning for sending this over. Uh, I'm very appreciative. When are you coming to Maine again? He was with us a few years ago as we did a week of uh, children's ministry here, and it went very well. Elijah will not let Elijah out of his sight. We need Elijahs in our lives. They have walked together for seven plus years. And this is something that that if we want to have God's power operating in our lives, then your, your spiritual power and your future ministry is greatly influenced by your present company or lack thereof. I cannot emphasize that enough this morning. It is important to find mentors, not just not living mentors only, but even, even men and women who have died, but we have these great biographies that are written to inspire us. So this is the last day. These are the last hours that these two godly men will have together. And it all begins in a place called Gilgal. And each of the three places mentioned today are very important. They, they have historic significance. Gilgal. If you remember when Joshua led that new generation of Israelites across the Jordan into the promised land to begin to do battle and fight and conquer it, the first encampment was at Gilgal, and something significant happened there. Before they were allowed to go and do battle against Jericho, the first city, God said all of the men must be circumcised. Because this was the seal and the sign of the covenant between God and his people Israel. And for some reason, this rebellious generation before them did not have their children circumcised. And so God said, this, is, this must come first. And this is significant to us even today because our lifelong lesson is spiritual circumcision. Circumcision of the heart cutting off of the flesh, of fleshly, worldly desires, sinful desires, sinful passions. And this is so vital to the Christian life, to the victorious life. We cannot tolerate small or big sins. Solomon said it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. These little sins, so-called, can do great damage. If you tolerate some sin in your life that you think is not, not really a, a big deal, not hurting anybody else, it's kind of like a, a frosty night that sets in over your soul. And you get up in the morning and there's a thin glaze of ice on the pond. But it's just a thin glaze. And if your heart is tender before God and if there comes some conviction of that sin, maybe through reading the scriptures or by the Holy Spirit speaking to you or uh, by a sermon you hear or whatever, if there's some conviction that comes, it's like a little stone gets tossed out on the pond and the ice cracks and breaks. It's easy to break the ice initially. But if you delay or deny repentance... If you let it go on and if you tolerate that sin, it becomes, if it becomes habitual, then the pond 
freezes over and the ice gets thicker and thicker and thicker to the point that you can no longer break it. The heart becomes obstinate. It becomes defiant. It becomes arrogant. And this is where Israel is at as a nation, as an entire nation. The ice on the pond is four feet thick. They have become so stiff-necked and so hard-hearted that no matter even the great Elijah preaching to them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't do a thing to those hard hearts. And they are plunging toward, headlong toward destruction. Let it not be you. Let it not be you. Let the word of God melt your heart this morning. If there is some sin that, that you are tolerating or that you're not repenting of, let the word of God melt the ice and keep a tender heart before him. God told Elijah, go to Bethel. This would be eight and a half miles to the west. Fairly long walk. Take a few hours to get there. Bethel is another important historic place in the Bible. Bethel means the house of God. You will remember Jacob when he was fleeing from Esau, that he camped overnight outside of a city called Luz. And as he was sleeping that night, his head on a stone, he had a dream. A dream that was more like a vision of a, of a magnificent ladder stretching from heaven down to earth and angels descending and ascending on that ladder. Jesus would later refer to that in his ministry. And when he woke up in the morning, he said, wow, this is, God is here and I didn't even know it. This is none other than Bethel, the house of God. And then many centuries later, when the kingdom was, was divided between the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. And a new king rose up, the first king over the northern tribes. His name was Jeroboam. And one of the first things that he did, he said, I don't want my people going down to the temple in Jerusalem. I don't want them worshiping down there because they may betray me. So he set up a new temple and he set up a golden calf in Bethel for his people to worship. And he led them into idolatry. 20 out of 20 kings in that northern kingdom did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not one of them followed the Lord. Their hearts were so, so hard and so icy. And they led their people deeper and deeper into the bondage of sin. And so much so that Bethel became Beth Avon. The house of God became the house of wickedness. And yet, yet, thank God, he preserved for himself a remnant in Israel. There's not only Elijah and Elijah, but there are also these two seminaries that most likely Elijah instituted. One in Bethel, of all places, and the other in Jericho. And they are training up these new prophets, the sons of the prophets, training them to be godly leaders and to go out and preach the word and live the word of God. In the midst of all of that political and religious madness, Elijah has established these two schools of the prophets. I have been praying that in whatever time God has given me left here in my present position that I would know what the priorities would be. And one of them, I'm convinced, is to spend all the time I can to train up more godly leadership for the future of Cornerstone and for the future of Maine. He came to Bethel, and we can assume that he had a final sermon for the school of prophets there. What we do know is that the Holy Spirit had revealed to those prophets that Elijah was going to be taken from Elijah today. And likewise in Jericho, the Holy Spirit had revealed the same thing there. And they're not sure what that meant. 
because even after he was taken and they, they witnessed it, the prophets in Jericho did, they went out and searched for Elijah for three days. But Elijah knew the truth. He knew that God was taking Elijah away to heaven. He knew he would not ever see him again. And when they said, do you know that your master will be taken from you today? He said, yes, I know. Be quiet. I don't want to discuss it. It was too hurtful to him. From Bethel, they go to Jericho. And again, Elijah says, look, Elijah, you stay here. God has told me to go to Jericho, not on your life. As the Lord lives and as, my, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And again, he's defiant about it. So they walked 14 miles southeast to the city of Jericho. Another important historic site in Scripture. What happened there? Well, the very first battle when the children of Israel came into the land to conquer it, the first battle they fought was against Jericho. And they really didn't fight it, did they? God said, walk around the city for the next seven days. Once a day, the last day, walk around seven times, blow your trumpet, and shout. And when they did, the walls caved in on Jericho. And the only ones that were saved that day were Rahab and her family. And Joshua put a curse on the city, a prophetic curse. He said, the man who rebuilds the city one day will do so at the expense of his eldest and his youngest son. The city had recently been rebuilt. The man who built it, when he laid the foundation, his oldest son died. When he laid the gates to finish it off, his youngest son died. They go to, to Jericho. And here, again, I would assume that Elijah gives his last address to this college of the prophets. And by now, you've got to figure it's late in the day because they've walked over 22 miles. They have spent time in Bethel. They've spent time in Jericho. And the Spirit of God says, Elijah, go to the Jordan. So again, he says to Elijah, you stay here. God has told me to go to the Jordan. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. I'm going with you. And so they go to the Jordan River. Another great historic site in the scriptures, in both the Old and the New Testaments. So many mentions of important events at the Jordan. Remember when Israel came to the border of Canaan and they sent the 12 spies in, they crossed the river. They came back and 10 of them gave a bad report and said, we can't do it. Later, the next generation of Israelites are led across the Jordan in, a, in an amazing way that we'll talk about in a moment as Joshua leads them in to conquer the land. Many centuries later, David will be ferried across the Jordan River as he's fleeing from Absalom. John the Baptist, a thousand years later, will baptize Jesus in the Jordan. We could go on and on. But on this day, there, there are twin miracles that take place here. The final miracle of Elijah, the first miracle of Elisha, the same miracle. It is the capstone miracle of Elijah, the cornerstone miracle of Elisha. And there are 50 witnesses. The school of the prophets followed them out at a distance to watch it. Verse 8, now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. What a sight. If you, you can imagine the, the river flowing down full of water, too deep or too swift to ford across, and when he slaps that water with his robe, the waters begin to to stand up and back up far to the north and the waters to the south just dry up. The riverbed goes dry. And this has happened before. When Israel entered the promised land to conquer it, Joshua chapter 3, 
verse 14. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the, the time of harvest. This is flood season that the waters which came from, the, from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, a city called Adam. There, a lot of flooding is going on as the waters are backing up. So the waters that went down the other way into the salt sea, into the dead sea, those waters were cut off and the people crossed over to Jericho on dry ground. And then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. They stood there the whole time as Israel is crossing. Probably two million or more people will cross the Jordan that day as they're standing there holding the ark on, with poles on their shoulders. And all the time the, dry, the, the ground is dry beneath them. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. What an amazing sight it must have been. And Elijah repeats it, and Elijah will repeat it. The only thing that would match it in the Old Testament is when, when Moses held out his rod over the Red Sea, and the waters likewise parted and stood up, and Israel crossed on dry ground until Pharaoh and his armies pursued and God brought the waters back down and destroyed his army. Verse 9, And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, Ask what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elijah didn't hesitate. I, he probably thought about this long and hard before. He said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And this brings us to the second lesson here. How do you experience the power of God? You walk and keep company with the godly and don't get separated. Secondly, seek a double portion of God's grace. Like Joshua succeeding Moses, Elijah was in great need of what his spiritual father possessed. The, the, the power the, of the Spirit of God in his life. If he was going to be the new leader of the prophets, if he's going to stand against these wicked kings like Elijah stood up and did, if he's going to preach boldly to this spiritually, morally corrupt nation, he says, I need a double portion of your spirit. What's he asking for? Is he saying, Elijah, I want to be twice as powerful as you? No. This is, keep this in Jewish context here. What is the double blessing? It is the blessing of the firstborn. Deuteronomy 21, 17. When a father would, in Israel would divide up his land, he would give different portions to his sons, but he would give a double portion to his eldest son. If he had six sons, he would divide up his inheritance into seven portions. They'd all get one, but the eldest would get two. The reason being, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, 17, for he is the beginning of his father's strength, and he has the right of the firstborn. Albert Barnes wrote, Elijah therefore asked for twice as much of Elijah's spirit as should be inherited by any other of the sons of the prophets. He's simply claiming to be acknowledged as Elijah's firstborn spiritual son. And Elijah says, I don't know. You are asking a hard thing, Elijah. But I'll tell you this, if you see me when I'm taken from you, that'll be the sign that it will be granted. I have a little confession to make here. Sometimes when I consider uh, my peers, other pastors that I rub shoulders with, I, 
I'm just sometimes overwhelmed with a sense of they're just so much more gifted and smarter than I am. And I'm not being humble here, I'm just being honest. And so it, what that does, it causes me to desperately pray for the double portion. Lord, I, I need so much more of your spirit to be able to do what you're calling me to do. And the good news is that God delights to give his spirit, to give his spirit's power in proportion to our yieldedness, to the degree that we're willing to die to ourselves, to the degree that we're willing to cut off the flesh and to surrender to God's will and rely on God's power, to that degree he will give his power. He will give the double portion. He will give triple portions. As you study the life of Elijah, you, you see that he's just entirely sold out to God. In fact, he does twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And God's Spirit worked mightily in him. Verse 11 begins, and then it happened. And I always underline it when these, I see these words in Scripture. And then it happened, or it came to pass. Because whenever you read that, there's always something great about to take place. Luke 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the Roman world should be taxed. What's the big deal about that? That was God's way of moving a peasant girl who was pregnant and her husband from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem so the Messiah could be born there and prophecy be fulfilled. And it came to pass. Oh, by the way, then it happened. It also, I think this chapter began the same way, and it came to pass as this whole scenario was unfolded. As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. What a terrifying sight this must have been. These steeds charging up and, and separating the two prophets. And this is the only way that Elijah is going to be separated from Elijah is something this powerful happens. It separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. The drama here is just breathtaking. If you stop to think about what's going on, the snorting and the stomping of these stallions, these fiery stallions, the grinding of the wheels of these blazing chariots, the flaming angelic drivers on those chariots, the explosive roar of this whirlwind, all the, the, the lights, the, the sounds, the colors that Elijah is seeing here. It's even more spectacular than uh, Dave Daly's impressive fireworks on the 4th of July. We did a lot of ooing and aahing here as those lights were exploding in the sky. But that, that's just a little spark compared to a forest fire of what Elijah was experiencing here. I am positive that he was on his face on the ground trembling like Saul of Tarsus when Jesus surrounded him with that Shekinah glory. The awesomeness is just overwhelming. And it says in verse 12, Elijah saw it, meaning, yes, he gets the double portion. And he cried out, my father, my father, my spiritual father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes in grief and tore them into two pieces. Why do you think he says here the, the chariot of Israel? Not the chariot of fire like the movie, but the chariot of Israel. What does he mean by that? Well, it's a metaphor for Elijah. Elijah is the greatest chariot of Israel. He is the great protector of Israel. He is the true defense of of Israel by his instruction, by his preaching, by his prayers, by his ministry, by him standing up to these corrupt kings, by his stand against the immoral, idolatrous generation that he's in. 
He is the greatest protection for Israel from the impending judgment that was, was headed toward it. His life was better than a thousand of Israel's chariots. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Who the great chariot of Maine might be or the great chariot of United States. I'd like to know because I would like to attach myself to that person, wherever it is. But there is a sense in which every believer here is a chariot of God. That we are, we are standing up in our nation and we are, the more godly we are, hopefully the more we are holding back the evil of this society. Something to think about. Elijah ascended up to heaven like the Lord Jesus, who was also attended by angels. After he ascended, the angels are saying to, to his apostles and disciples, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing upward? Don't you know that he's coming back in like manner? The difference between Elijah and Jesus is that Elijah didn't die physically as Jesus did before his ascension. And that's only happened one other time in the history of the world. Genesis 5:24 it says Enoch walked with God and Enoch was not for God took him. At the ripe young age of 365 years old God raptured Enoch. He ascended up to heaven without dying physically. And these two men are just tokens of a greater ascension to come. When Christ returns, those who are alive at that moment will also ascend up. And they will be transformed, receiving their new glorious body. Those who are dead in Christ will rise up even before them and ascend up with their new bodies. And then ultimately we will return to heaven on earth forever and ever. Elijah is gone. And Elijah is wondering, how can I ever feel the sandals of this mighty prophet of God? Is it even possible that God could use me? Well, it was time for him to find out. He picked up the mantle of Elijah, Elijah and he headed for the river. Years ago, that same mantle had been laid on his shoulders when he was called to ministry. So now he takes it back and he repeats the same thing that Elijah did. He rolled it up and he struck the water and he said, where is the God of Elijah? Are you with me or are you not, O oh God? And immediately the waters divided this way and that. And he crossed over on dry ground. This is what he needed. He needed this to know that the God of Elijah was indeed with him. To begin his ministry with the same miracle that Elijah ended his with was just huge confirmation. And then more confirmation comes in verse 15. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah is on Elijah. And they came to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. Not to worship him, but to honor him as their new leader. The mantle of Elijah has fallen on you. We recognize that. The, that mantle was the symbol of Elijah's ministry. Like the towel and the basin were the symbol of the Lord Jesus' ministry. Striking the water with that mantle was an act of faith by Elijah, an act of total dependence and trust in the Lord and in God's power. And this brings us to the third lesson. Take up the mantle of ministry and by faith strike your Jordan. Every one of us as believers is called to serve the Lord Jesus, to do works that will bless and build up the body of Christ, to do works that will in the world, influence the lost to come to Christ, to be attracted to Jesus. What hinders you? What holds you back? What wall is in your way? What river 
is there before you that you cannot afford? Is there some sin in your life? Are you thinking, I can't serve God because there's this sin, I'm just not willing to let go of it. I enjoy it too much. Is it laziness? I don't feel like it. I'm too tired. I don't want to take on any more responsibility. I just want to be in my own little world. Is it busyness? Oh, my plate is so full. I, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to bake that cake and take it over to that person that's sick or, or that family that's in need. I don't have time to go and help them out right now. Or is it entertainment? Are you so preoccupied with just having fun that you don't have time for ministry? What is your Jordan? Is it fear? I might fail. I might make a mistake. I might make a fool of myself. I'm too worried about what people think. What is your Jordan? Where is the God of Elijah? I'm asking all of us this morning, will you pick up the mantle of ministry and by faith strike your Jordan? Will you say, God, I repent. I yield to you. I want your power in my life. I yield to your will. Please remove this roadblock. Please tear down this wall. Please part the waters. Will you surrender it to him? Will you trust him? If you will, I'll tell you where the God of Elijah is. He is, is as near and as ready to bless you as your yieldedness to him. The choice is yours and mine. How yielded are we willing to be? Let's pray. Psalm 110.3 says, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. Lord, would, that would be our prayer this morning that we would be willing, surrendered, yielded to you in every facet of our lives, that there be nothing between us and you. But Lord, that if there are obstacles by your power, you would demolish them. Would you please, Lord, just set us free from any bondages, from any distractions? Would you empower us, God, to take up the mantle of ministry and do your work and do your will and do it rejoicing and, and with glad hearts? Help us to do now what we will be doing all eternity serving you with glad, exuberant worship. Lord, grant what you will and will what you grant. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
benediction from the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.